that's, you know, it's, I wrote this movie because I kind of was, I wanted to see a movie like this. And I love John Hughes and, and I just grew up in the eighties and I, 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 I always felt at the end of all the John Hughes movies and indeed a lot of the 80s movies, there was always a really warm and pleasant denouement and there's like a moral of the story. And while I wanted it to be this really brazen romp, I also wanted it to end with that warm nostalgia and that like, just that yummy feeling where you, you kind of like, you walk away from the film feeling uplifted. And I think that that is something that is it's so associated with the 80s and 80s films. You generally know really you're going to get one of these endings with that sort of film. Um, and in, in these times, I mean, I've been avoiding anything that's too heavy or anything that's too, too bleak um, at the moment. And I think this was like the perfect sort of antidote to the, the times we were in just now. I, I, I wanted to make something happy. There's so many films out there that sort of like, I feel like a lot of the, they're, they're hard work to watch because they are really deep and really emotional and that definitely you know serves a purpose and it's a great way of just telling stories but I mean I'm I'm so into that sort of fun camp um type of film and like I loved my one of my favorite movies ever was Airplane with Leslie Nielsen did you ever see that absolutely yeah the absurdity of it I love I don't know. I just love, it's just my funny bone. I just love yeah. things that are completely unrealistic and totally absurd. Um, the layers upon layers of gags as well. You, you know, you can you can watch it once and you maybe only pick up 70% of the gags and then you've got the other ones to kind of look forward to the more you rewatch it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope it's that kind of movie. I hope it's kind of like an animal house that people put on when they're throwing a party or something. You know what I mean? Have it in the background. Um, so yeah, Thank but I'm... I'm Tonally, I was kind of getting sort of the Witches of Eastwick, uh, Death Becomes Her, that sort of like dark, but also so camp, so so camp and in so your funny. Face. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah. I'm so excited that you liked it. I, I'm kind of curious to see how British audiences respond to it, um, because I think that it's maybe a bit more British humor. Um, British humor is a bit more shan, and we're a bit we're a bit more. Um, we like to, I don't know how to describe it. We're kind of like, we're, we can be a bit cruel with our humour. Yeah, yeah. I think as well, British audiences do have a kind of darker taste for, for humour because I know personally, anytime I watch an American sitcom and there's a laughter track and, you know, it's that kind of like, you don't need to be told when to laugh. It's And I think <laughs> um, Me, You, Madness definitely has that kind of sense of, you want to kind of find the humour yourself. And it's... Um, I, I can't watch it with my friends because... You know, because I wrote it, I want them to hear every single joke, like hear the joke because they're coming kind of like at you in different directions. And if they start laughing or talking or saying, oh, my God, I love that outfit. Or, blah, 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 I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, I pause the movie and I'm like, get the laughter out because you've missed two or three of the jokes. I'm going to need to rewind it. So I'm no fun to watch it with. I did just watch the French dub, which is really funny. Oh, really? So, I, I mean, do you have much input in who provides the, the dubbing or is it just people that are... My business that? partner, my business partner picked the company to do the French dub. I don't know if you're familiar with how sort of the world of foreign, selling your film foreign works, but we're very hands-on um, because we don't like prices to sort of escalate and they charge you up. So we actually hired the dubbing company. But it was sort of funny to hear the characters speaking in French. And it's almost even funnier because somehow when it's translated she's speaking so fast like like it's just, it's really fun to watch it's just really silly so okay, thinking of the the sort of central concept of me madness what was it that the kind of that spurred you to create this i think um i had rewatched sunset boulevard and i've just always been a huge fan of um the femme fatale genre and i started to do more research into it and I'd watched Double Indemnity with Barbara Stanwyck and obviously like the uh, um, Basic Instinct is one of my favourite films and um, I also re-watched uh, Glenn Close in Fatal Attraction and there have been a lot of other French movies that have this femme fatale genre and I like I liked you know and it was really uh, it all began sort of in the in the golden era of cinema in like in the 40s um, and I like it when there's a woman in charge who is three steps ahead of the other characters 
And I also liked the idea of playing with um, switching the gender stereotypes. So Catherine embodies many sort of alpha male um, characteristics. She's a boss. She runs a hedge fund, which there's not that many women in the world of finance. Um, she, you know, is sexually very empowered and confident in her, in her sexuality. And she, um, she likes fast cars. I just wanted to make almost like a modern Amer American psycho because I love that book too. And I always found, um, you know, all of the, all of the, the brilliance and the satire of American Psycho, I just loved. And I was actually reading about it yesterday and they were saying part of the sad satire at the end of the film is that he's telling people all these gruesome things that he's done and no one actually believes him. And I realized maybe that was subliminally why I wrote into Me Madness. You know, she does say to, to Tyler, she gives him heads up. She's like, well, we can't rule out that I might put your head in a burlap sack and I might drop you in the ocean, but I can't fly. Or, you know, he's like, you're so beautiful. She's like, I'm a, I'm a psychotic killer, whatever. And, um, sorry, I'm not answering your question. No, not at all. I'm why, intrigued. Would, why, why did I, what, what was so it? What inspired the kind of it, central concept? You've kind of gone there. You've gone with the femme fatales and the uh, classic cinema. Yeah. Uh, but, but, to turn, but to also turn the genre upside down and to make it a parody. I just thought it was quite funny. And um, and I also wanted to make a movie that was really an homage to, to 80s cinema. And we've talked a bit about that. Obviously there's a big 80s soundtrack in the film. Um, and that was the most expensive element of the production was the music. Um, but it was important to me to, to have it in there. Um, yeah, to, to take to take Ben Fatal and to turn it upside down and make it a parody and a comedy. I wanted a movie just filled with laughs and silliness, but also, I don't know if you if you caught all of the little buried treasure, but I say lines from Basic Instinct in the movie. And then there's like the homage to Footloose where the guy's dancing with his feet like this in front of, and then of course there's flash dance references and references to Cocktail, the movie with Tom Cruise and um, obviously to American Psycho and there's plenty more, but, um, how making a movie about movies is to me i thought it was fun and really i really enjoyed it mm -hmm. um and in terms of your your sort of personal challenges stepping into the director's chair was there you know was there ever any moments to actually enjoy the experience or is it just stress 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 no i enjoyed it i enjoyed it um many times i will say that when you're in the comfort of your living room sitting on a sofa cozy watching a movie you can be lulled into believing that the filmmaking process was comfortable and, you know, and that the characters are really, you know, um, happy. But actually that shoot was fairly rigorous and exhausting and the location was freezing. Um, so cold that at one point my Steadicam operator came over to me and said, Louise, we need to shave your whole upper body, all the hair because it's catching the light, because I'm quite blonde. It was catching the light because I was so cold on set, like especially during the dinner sequence, um, where we look like we're having a lovely dinner and we're drinking champagne. It was like sub-zero temperatures in that house. And um, also because the crew kept coming in and out and opening the doors, we couldn't keep the heat in. So in so I found I found it physically challenging directing this movie. That the, the the times I enjoyed directing the most was when um, either I wasn't in the scene and I could just be sitting wearing a pair of Ugg boots and sweatpants. Um, otherwise, it was it was fairly um, you know our our days were long. We were doing um, minimum twelve hour days, sometimes overtime, and I was in high heels a lot of the time. Like it's funny because that character is so into fashion. I like fashion too. But generally, I'm in a pair of leggings and a pair of, um, like, a pair of um, cool Nike Airs, like, today. Um, I've learned, I've got a running list of mistakes that we made on Me Madness and things I learned as a director, things as a producer as well. Um, seven days into filming, the Woolsey fires ripped through Malibu and burned down the entire, like, 10-mile um, radius. And so for several months we didn't know if our location had burned down and as you know young producers or um not young necessarily but like um 
newish producers, we, I think we misjudged how much insurance we should have. And we assumed that there would no, not be a force majeure situation, like a fire ripping through. Um, and, you know, we also had, because we were evacuated so quickly, we didn't have any time to um, pick up uh, all of the equipment. So then for many, many, many weeks, we were paying for these astonishingly expensive pieces of camera equipment. Um, and so challenging. It was very challenging. Post-production was very challenging. Um, but um, I, I learned so, so much on this film. And actually, in the end, the four-month gap after that first week of filming gave me the time to look at my dailies and say, okay, this is what I'm not liking. Um, let me see what this camera package is. I didn't like the camera package. I didn't like the lens package. And I think in the film, there are certain scenes where you can maybe tell, like, well, I can tell definitely. And the other thing is when they drive up and they meet for the first time and it's really windy, there's leaves on all of the trees because it's November and it, they're all like, it's like autumn. And then the second that they walk into the house, if you look carefully, you'll see the outside, it's completely still and there's no leaves on anything because there was a four month gap between us shooting that outside part and then the inside part. It was what, what a weird experience. So yeah, next time, um, more insurance. I'll take much more time. Storyboarding is everything. Um, I was very, very involved with Ray on the color schemes and the lighting design. Um, and I know you, you picked up on that. Um, but I'm, I'm like a very controlling director and I like to be involved in every teeny tiny aspect of everything. And we got off to a bit of a rough start actually. Uh, we filmed all of the stuff that uh, in Catherine's office and then this was very uh, like in the first week of filming and then I went back and I looked at it and he and he had taken neon to mean like and basically a neon gel that goes right over the lighting okay. and then subsequent subsequently everything was neon green including my face the costume everything the whole room became green so we ended up refilming that on the final day of shooting and then you'll notice that all the neons are behind the character rather than bathing the entire space. So, you know, we had to kind of spend some time really trying to understand, understand each other in terms of what, and, and, you know, I would typically get onto the set and I would frame up and I'd look and I'm like, this, this neon isn't, it's not enough. We need to move these in, things in. And, um, yeah. I think the, obviously you mentioned the neons and things that really does kind of play into this overall kind of 80s uh, sort of homage that is so kind of prevalent throughout the film. Um, and I think, so does the tone, you've, you've kind of, as we kind of previously said, you really kind of capture that energetic, sort of vibrant camp sort of tone that so many of 80s classics have. Um, when you were writing, was that something that was quite a, a challenge to in, sort of instill in the script? Or, you know, how did you ensure that the tone was the way you wanted it when you were writing? You know, I wrote it so fast. Uh, I wrote it in like two weeks and then I sent the draft out and then took one more week to do changes. Um, I just enjoyed writing this so much and it was just coming into my mind so quickly and like little jokes would come up and I'd immediately run back to my computer and type them in. Um, um, it was, I just, I sort of like, I think you go, go into writing something with the tone in mind and then I was also listening to all the 80s music and remembering, you know, even Ferris Bueller's Day Off and, and I write to music as well. So I'll play the 80s songs and then it'll remind me of certain movies that I've seen as a kid. And um, writing it was the easiest part, actually, I think, of this whole experience was writing it. That's, that's what I enjoyed the most. Um, I've started writing a sequel that's a bit like Overboard. Wow where I don't know if we'll ever get an opportunity to film it, but it depends how successful the movie is. I hope people, I hope people watch it in the UK. Um, but um, I love, I love to write. It's, um, it's such a pleasure. And it's, it's not something that I find, I don't find it that hard. I'm working on a TV show at the moment um, based on a book. And I am finding that much more challenging because I'm writing from a piece of IP and it's much more difficult when it's not just all tumbling out of your own brain and you've yeah. got to kind of work around. Fantastic. But yeah. And you, can you tell me the book? 
or is that you know top no it's it's called um no it's called confessions of a master jewel thief and it's about the most prolific jewel thief in american history and he had um a a, a life by day as a suburban dad and um and then he was a cat burglar stealing from Margot Hemingway, um, uh, Liz Taylor, Armand Hammer, you name it. And he was such a fascinating character. Um, and all of his tactics were so um, low tech, okay. which I kind of love. And so I optioned it about three years ago, and then I started working on it during COVID as a, as a show. We originally wanted to do it as a movie, and now I realize everything is in television these days. You can make so much more money in TV, and it just moves faster. So, um, so I'm just working on the Bible for that. But it, I recommend reading it because it's 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 just a nice book. I'm a voracious reader. What do you like to read? I like the kind of the classics like Cormac McCarthy, uh, Love Gore Vidal, these sort of Norman Mailer, all these kind of old school, in a sense, they're probably dinosaurs now and most of them have probably passed away. But, um, but I love it. You've got to send me some recommendations because I listen to Audible while I'm doing my gardening and stuff and while I'm packing and cleaning and blah, blah, blah. So I'm like going through one or two books a week and I'm always looking for good recommendations. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, that, that was my degree back at, back at university was, was English uh, lit. So, yeah, it's it, it's kind of in there. But as you say, there, there is so much TV out there. There's so many films out there that I really need to be quite diligent with myself and say, right, you're going to sit down and you're going to read for an hour before you go to sleep because uh -huh. it's so easy to be swayed by all these other distractions. I know. I find reading just very peaceful. I, 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 in my old age, I've gotten to gardening. It's quite funny. I feel like the whole experience of making me mad, this has turned me a bit introvert. And this interview is a lot of fun, but I've done like a hundred, maybe more. We started doing them back in February with the US release. And then I did, I've got, I've got another one with Irish breakfast. And I've realized that I actually, I'm quite introvert and I, I like chatting to people, but I feel sometimes in interviews very put on the spot and you, you have to answer so many questions and be so prepared and so on. And um, sometimes that's challenging, but I was very excited about this one because I read your review and I'm like, okay, he's, he's going to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, you know, I, I'm actually, this is a thing. And when it comes to, to film reviews and things, I would rather only put it out there if it's positive. I know you have to kind of have a, a degree of criticism, but at the end of the day, there, there's so much negativity out there that, you think it's so crazy um, yeah it's I, I feel like it wasn't like this when I was a kid and in the 90s I don't think it was I really think it's all happened with the dawn of social media and I think that um the you know it's people um people have a soapbox and there's a lot of envy as well I think so I just stay out of all of it I don't even look at I don't look at social media. I don't have it. My I've got someone that runs mine for me because I just can't be bothered. And also sucks up so much of your time, you know? Absolutely. Classic. Well, um, I, I need to kind of obviously go back to this quote that, that Catherine mentions. She says, let's all just be a little bit kinder to one another, which is, is such a nice message to put at the, the heart of the film. Do you kind of, was there a part of you putting that out there yourself as, you know, someone that's faced a lot of kind of, uh, yeah, representation and people ask me that quite a lot actually it was more of a general message because as we were saying earlier um i feel like the world has become quite cagey and quite nasty and um i'm not even on social media and i've got people to patrol it and they say oh you know there's only a couple of trolls or haters and we just delete and block but otherwise everyone's quite nice but i worry also for like my stepchildren i see how nasty it can be and I'm not a nasty person. I'm just a very gentle person. And I'm very um, empathetic and I don't like seeing people get their feelings hurt. And having been in the world of politics and also in entertainment, I've seen, I don't take it personally because I see the um, amount of criticism that's leveled on everyone in every direction, whether, you know, um, whether they deserve it or not, right? And um, so it was more of a general message um, I think when I first wrote the screenplay, it was a completely different line. It was much more in the Catherine kind of vein, right? But then I, I thought that it's such a cruel world out there. So the message was really more 
Also, I was in the middle of the political fray, right? So I see how Democrats are being critical to Republicans and Republicans are being critical of Democrats. And I was in DC and it was like this intolerably toxic feeling. And, um, and I, it was, yeah, it was just much more of a, a, a general message, kind of like the moral of the story. And also Catherine started off as a not nice person, right? So it's sort of her archetype changes. And so her arc is she starts off as this diabolical bitch that talks people down and yells at people. And, you know, but by the end, she's softened because she's fallen in love and she's, you know, she's about to start a family and all these other things. So, yeah, it was a, just a very general, like, let's all just be a little kinder to each other, you know? And also politically, I think, I mean, just aside from being people in actual politics, just the anger, you know, families breaking up over Thanksgiving because they don't, they can't agree on political issues. So, yeah, it's just a general, it's just how I feel. I, I, feel I, I like, think obviously Catherine is a character that she doesn't judge based on political um, interests because, you know, she would kill a, a Republican or, or a Democrat. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think kind of says it all. It's just like, really like does it does it matter like, you know it, as long as you are a good person exactly because i i'm not republican um and i think that um I, I mean i i'm i'm very much independent and i but i'm very liberal so i guess there was times when it was hard to sort of be seen through the political rubric as the wife of someone who's working for such a controversial president um and i really just wanted to sort of be left out of the whole thing um, which I obviously didn't do a very good job of, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, I, I hope I, I that think... when people, sorry, sorry, I just hope that when people watch this movie, they get a slightly different impression because I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm quite, I'm okay at taking the piss out of myself, you know, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> and I, I think people will, will pick that up because I, I don't think you could watch the film and you think, oh, you know, this is someone taking themselves very seriously. And it's, it's if and if you do have that impression, then you have totally misjudged it. Um, right. But um, I, I think as well, like the, it's this kind of sense of creating a camp classic. It's you, someone that takes himself particularly seriously isn't going to be involved in something that's a wee bit over the top and flamboyant. And so I, I, I think people will pick that up. Yeah. Uh, was there, I, I, was, sorry. I toyed with the idea of like having um, like some footage of Louise Linton on the TV or something and having Catherine be like, oh, not her again, turn it off, you know, but I didn't get, I didn't, uh, I didn't get around to doing that. That's maybe for the sequel. Um, yeah. Was there any sort of desire to, to hold off the release for a cinema release or I, I maybe it has played in theatres in the US? Um, um, there was, we considered um, putting it out uh la like last fall but the studio um really liked it as a valentine's film so it i also did want to give a bit of breath between what i anticipated could be a very contentious election and inauguration and my film coming out i think i it would have raised more eyebrows had Stephen still been in office. Um, I was game for putting it out earlier, but I think the timing ended up being right because, you know, obviously the end of everything that happened in DC was so heartbreaking um, for everyone. And I, I was really pleased to have distance between that and my film because the two things are completely unrelated. Um, and film has nothing to do with politics and I now have nothing to do with politics so yeah I think it was the right time I think that it was the right time to come out yeah um, and kind of thinking of the future with obviously Storm Chaser films what says what is on the agenda I know you've mentioned a possible sequel and the TV series um yeah I'm, I'm working on two um I'm working on two TV bibles at the moment one is for the confessions um book and then the other one I was approached by some studio executives that actually liked me madness and um I pitched them this idea about you know they said boy you must have some really interesting 
experiences that you could write from from Washington DC. I said I really did and you know what always astom astonished me was that as the wife of someone at that level in the cabinet how much access you have to the White House, to the Treasury, to the State Department, to Air Force One, to Marine One, to Camp David, to all these individuals as well. And I always thought it was really funny that, you know, no, like no one ever suspected that I could have been a spy, but I could have been, you know? <laughs> and so I'm toying with this idea of writing from my experiences in DC, but writing a fictional tale of a woman who's married to like the Secretary of State and she's actually a foreign operative. Um, I, I, yeah, I kind that of, sounds I, fun. yeah, it does. And, and they really like it. I've just actually started watching a really good show on Netflix called, um, spy, what's it called? Spy something, spy catch. Or, uh, you should watch it if you're interested in spy stuff, but it's giving me all like the artillery I need for what she's up to <laughs> and what gadgets she's using and everything else. Um, yeah. So that's, that's the other TV show that I'm working on at the moment. So, um, Again, it's more complicated than writing something linear that's for, for a film. And obviously you're writing a massive amount more than a typical screenplay because it's 60 minutes per episode. So that's 60 pages. And you're like, okay, how am I going to fill 60 pages? But I like the idea of um, being a show creator in the future and like following in the path of people I admire, like Shonda Rhimes. Um, not that I think I could ever become that successful, but I, I, I like what she's done with yeah. her career um and that's really the dream uh we don't have any other features in pre-production right now even though we've got them on the slate we've got um a, a, i purchased a script a couple of years ago um called shadows on the grass which is which is something that i may, might like to direct it's um about uh, it's kind of like a female revenant okay um and so I'm just thinking about how I'd like to cast that and when I'd like to shoot it in Canada. But um, yeah, so so that's it. And then I'm launching a, a vegan and sustainable fashion line in a couple of months. Fantastic. Yeah, so busy. So busy. I mean, less busy now that the films come out. I'm, I'm glad I've only got a few more interviews. Um, <laughs> because they're, they're like a lot, they're kind of a lot of work. Uh, yeah. Not this one. This one's been lovely, but like, especially if you have to get up in the middle of the night and like you're putting on wigs and doing your hair and you're kind of like lighting and all that, all that jazz. It's like a lot of, it's like a lot to do. But yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the fashion line and, um, working away on getting that launched and, uh, next the film opens in France. So hopefully I won't have too many interviews for France because I, I only speak un peu of French. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, that's that's most of my questions covered. So it has been an absolute delight uh, talking to you and finding out more about the film. So, so lovely to talk to you too. And